r slash no sleep posted by u slash carbotx watchers code i remember the day vividly it was a typical monday morning at the office the kind where the buzz of idle chatter competes with the relentless tapping of keyboards my co-worker susan a chatty woman in her mid-30s was bustling around her excitement palpable she had this habit of sharing every little detail about her son alex with anyone who'd listen guess what alex did this weekend susan beamed her eyes bright with maternal pride i offered a polite smile bracing myself for another mundane toddler tale but what happened next was anything but mundane susan thrust her iphone in my face showing me a video of her giggling two-year-old the chubby cheeked boy was playing with his blocks a picture of innocence suddenly he stopped turned towards the camera with an eerie calmness and said 01000100000110110110011000011000000 The number sent a chill down my spine. It wasn't just the precision and clarity with which he spoke, but the way he looked right into the camera as if he was seeing through it, through me. I laughed it off, attributing it to a fluke or perhaps a TV show he had mimicked. But deep down, something felt unsettling. The rest of the day passed in a blur. But Alex's words haunted me. As I lay in bed that night, a sense of unease crept over me. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to his words, a hidden meaning perhaps. Driven by a mix of curiosity and dread, I decided to look up the sequence of numbers. I wasn't prepared for what I found. The numbers were binary code, and when translated, they read, "He is watching." My heart pounded in my chest. Who was watching? And why did Alex say those words? The next few days were a haze of paranoia and fear. I couldn't concentrate at work, and every shadow in my apartment made me jump. I started seeing patterns everywhere, in the arrangement of leaves, the way people crossed the street, the flickering of lights. It was like the world was trying to communicate with me through a language I didn't understand. Then, 3 days after the incident, something happened that turned my world upside down. I was walking home from work when I saw him, a man in a black hoodie, standing across the street. staring directly at me our eyes met and a cold shiver ran through me i quickened my pace but he matched it always keeping the same distance i finally reached my apartment building and hurried inside my heart racing i peeked through the peephole but he was gone that night i barely slept every creak and groan of the building sending me into a panic the next morning i found a note slipped under my door it was just one word written in a jagged almost frantic scrawl run I wanted to go to the police, but what would I tell them? That a toddler's gibberish and a mysterious stalker were making me lose my mind? I decided to confront Susan. Perhaps she knew something, a piece of the puzzle that would make everything clear. But when I reached her desk, it was empty. A coworker told me she hadn't come in that day. A sense of dread filled me. Was she in danger too, or was she part of whatever was happening? I left work early, my mind racing with possibilities. As I walked down the deserted street, I felt eyes on me. I turned around, but there was no one there. I quickened my pace, but the feeling of being watched intensified. I started to run, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I reached my apartment, fumbled with the keys, and rushed inside. Slamming the door behind me, I leaned against it, trying to catch my breath. I was safe for now, but I knew it was just the beginning. Someone or something was after me. and it all started with Alex's words. I spent the rest of the evening scouring the internet, trying to find any clue that would explain what was happening. The more I dug, the more I realized how little I knew. But one thing was clear, I was in the middle of something dark and dangerous, and I had to find out what it was before it was too late. The next morning, I woke up with a sense of urgency. The events of the past few days had taken a toll on my sanity, but I couldn't let fear paralyze me. I needed answers, and the only lead I had was the binary code Alex had spoken. I started my investigation by diving deeper into binary codes and their uses. It was a rabbit hole of information, ranging from simple data encoding to complex cryptography used by intelligence agencies. The idea of a 2-year-old uttering a coded message was absurd, yet the reality of my situation was far from normal. As I sifted through forums and articles, a pattern began to emerge. The code Alex spoke could be part of a larger sequence. possibly a key to unlock something but what and how did a toddler come to know such a thing the more i thought about it the more i felt like i was missing a crucial piece of the puzzle in the midst of my research i received an anonymous email 
It contained the file named watchers.bin. Hesitant but driven by curiosity, I opened it. The file was a jumble of binary sequences, much longer than the one Alex had spoken. My heart raced as I began to decode it, line by line. The message was cryptic, they watch from the shadows, feeding on fear. The child sees, the child speaks. Beware the eyes that follow. Chills ran down my spine. The message was a warning, and it confirmed my worst fears. I was being watched by someone, or something, that thrived on fear. And Alex, somehow, was connected to it. I spent the rest of the day in a state of heightened alertness, jumping at every sound. The feeling of being watched grew stronger, and I kept catching glimpses of a shadowy figure in the corner of my eye. But whenever I turned to look, there was nothing there. That evening, as I walked home, I felt the presence again. The air around me felt charged, oppressive. I turned a corner and there he was, the man in the black hoodie, standing under a street lamp. But this time, he wasn't alone. There were others with him, all wearing hoodies, their faces obscured. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. They stood motionless, watching me. Then, as if on cue, they began to move towards me, slow and deliberate. I turned and ran, my mind racing with panic. I didn't know who they were or what they wanted, but I knew I couldn't let them catch me. I reached my apartment, slammed the door shut, and slid to the floor, gasping for breath. I was trapped in a nightmare, and I didn't know how to wake up. As I sat there, trying to calm my racing heart, I realized I needed help. But who would believe such an outlandish story? The police would think I was crazy. My friends and family wouldn't understand. I felt utterly alone. Then, it hit me. The only person who might have answers was Susan. She was Alex's mother, she had to know something. I decided to visit her the next day, unannounced. It was a long shot, but it was the only lead I had. That night, I barely slept. Every creak and whisper of wind sounded like someone trying to break in. I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, waiting for dawn. The first light of dawn brought no comfort, only the stark realization that I was deeply entangled in something far beyond my understanding. I decided to visit Susan, hoping she held the key to unraveling this mystery. The drive to her house was tense, every shadow and movement outside my car seemed ominous, a part of the nightmare that had become my reality. Upon reaching Susan's house, I noticed something was off. The front door was slightly ajar, an unusual sight for someone as cautious as Susan. My heart raced as I pushed the door open, calling out her name. The silence that greeted me was unsettling. The house was in disarray. Furniture overturned, and items scattered. It looked like there had been a struggle. Panic set in as I searched the house, fearing what I might find. But there was no sign of Susan or Alex. They had vanished, leaving behind a chaos of unanswered questions. In Alex's room, amidst the scattered toys, I found a drawing. It was crude, as expected from a toddler, but the imagery sent a cold shiver down my spine. It depicted several dark figures with glaring eyes surrounding a child. The child in the drawing was pointing at a series of binary codes scribbled at the bottom. It was the same sequence Alex had spoken. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. Alex hadn't randomly uttered those numbers, he was trying to communicate a message. A message that somehow linked him to these mysterious watchers. I took the drawing with me, hoping it might lead to some answers. As I left the house, a sense of dread washed over me. Susan and Alex were in danger, or worse, and I was somehow connected to their fate. Back at my apartment, I poured over the drawing, trying to decipher its meaning. The binary code was a piece of the puzzle, but I needed more. I decided to reach out to a friend who was well versed in cryptography and computer science. Maybe he could shed some light on this enigma. I met my friend, Mark, at a local cafe. I explained the situation as best I could, leaving out the more unbelievable parts. Mark listened intently, his fascination growing with every detail. When I showed him the binary code, his eyes widened. This isn't just a random sequence, he said, his voice tinged with excitement and concern. It's part of a sophisticated encryption algorithm. But it's incomplete. We need the rest to crack it. Mark agreed to help, and we spent hours working on the code, trying different combinations and patterns. The cafe closed, and we moved to my apartment, driven by a relentless need for answers. As night fell, we finally made a breakthrough. The code led to a set of coordinates, a location not far from the city. It was a risky move, but I knew I had to go there. Maybe it would lead me to Susan and Alex, or at least to the truth. I left Mark at my apartment, promising to call him with any updates. 
The drive to the coordinates was nerve-wracking. The location turned out to be an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of the city. The place reeked of decay and neglect, a perfect hideout for something sinister. I cautiously entered the warehouse, my senses on high alert. The inside was dark and eerie, filled with the echoes of my own footsteps. I used my phone's flashlight to navigate through the maze of crates and debris. As I delved deeper into the warehouse, I heard a faint sound. It was a whimper, barely audible over the sound of my own breathing. I followed the sound, my heart pounding with a mix of fear and hope. In a dimly lit corner of the warehouse, I found them. Susan and Alex were huddled together, bound and gagged. Relief washed over me, quickly replaced by a surge of protective rage. I rushed to free them, but before I could reach them, I felt a sharp blow to the back of my head. The world spun, and darkness enveloped me. When I came to, the dim, flickering lights of the warehouse swam into my blurry vision. My head throbbed with a searing pain, and I realized I was bound to a chair. Across from me, Susan and Alex were still tied up, fear etched on their faces. A shadowy figure emerged from the darkness, the man in the black hoodie, his face still obscured. You shouldn't have come here, he said, his voice a cold whisper that sent shivers down my spine. I demanded to know what was going on, why they were doing this. The man chuckled, a sound devoid of any warmth. You stumbled upon something bigger than you can imagine. This child, he gestured towards Alex, is special. His mind. It's like a key, unlocking doors we didn't even know existed. I struggled against my restraints, anger boiling within me. You're insane, I spat out. The man ignored my outburst. Those numbers he spoke, they were just the beginning. He sees things, patterns in the world that lead to power, to secrets hidden in plain sight. And we will use him to unlock them all. It dawned on me that this was no random stalking or kidnapping. This was a calculated move by a group with far-reaching influence and sinister motives. Alex, with his inexplicable ability to decipher and communicate complex codes, was their unwitting pawn. The man continued, we've been watching you since you decoded his first message. You have a talent for this, a useful talent. But you've become a liability. I realized that my attempts to solve the mystery had only drawn me deeper into their web. The Watchers, as the binary message had called them, were a group using Alex's unique skills for their own dark purposes. Susan was just a mother caught in the crossfire, and I, a curious bystander who had ventured too far into the unknown. The man's phone rang, breaking the tense atmosphere. He stepped away to answer it, giving me a moment to think. I looked around, searching for any means of escape or a way to free Susan and Alex. That's when I noticed it, a loose nail on the armrest of my chair. I began working at my bindings, trying to free myself without drawing attention. Time was running out, and I knew that our captor wouldn't hesitate to eliminate us if necessary. After what seemed like an eternity, I managed to free my hands. I quietly untied Susan and Alex, signaling them to stay silent. We needed to escape, but I also knew we couldn't let this group continue their nefarious activities. I had to find a way to expose them. As the man returned, I lunged at him, catching him off guard. A struggle ensued, with Susan helping to overpower him. In the chaos, Alex ran towards a table on the other side of the room. He began frantically typing on a laptop that lay open amongst a mess of papers and electronic devices. What are you doing? I yelled, trying to keep our captor subdued. I'm sending it all out, Alex replied, his tiny fingers flying over the keyboard. The codes, their plans, everything. I was stunned. Alex, the innocent child I thought we were protecting, was far more aware and capable than I could have ever imagined. He had understood the gravity of the situation and was now our best chance at stopping this group. The man broke free from our grasp and lunged for Alex, but it was too late. Alex hit the enter key, and the information was sent. The man screamed in rage, knowing their secrets were now exposed to the world. We didn't wait to see the consequences of our actions. Grabbing Alex, we ran from the warehouse, disappearing into the night. The sound of sirens approached in the distance, a sign that our message had been received. As we fled, I realized that our lives would never be the same. We had exposed a powerful group, but in doing so, we had also painted targets on our backs. The road ahead would be perilous, but at least we had each other. Together, we would face whatever came next. We found refuge in an old, abandoned cabin in the woods, miles away from the city. It was a temporary sanctuary, a place to catch our breath and plan our next move. The cabin, hidden amongst dense trees and forgotten by time, seemed like the only place where the watchers couldn't find us immediately. Susan, still in shock, held Alex close, her eyes reflecting a mix of fear and relief. 
Alex, on the other hand, appeared strangely calm, as if he understood more than any of us could fathom. I couldn't help but marvel at his resilience and his mysterious ability to perceive things beyond the ordinary. As we settled in, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being part of something much larger and more dangerous than I had ever imagined. The Watchers were not just a small group of fanatics, they were a well-organized syndicate with eyes and ears everywhere. Exposing them had disrupted their plans, but it had also made us prime targets. That night, under the dim light of an old lantern, we discussed our next steps. It was clear that we couldn't go back to our old lives. The Watchers would be looking for us, and anyone we contacted could be in danger. We had to stay off the grid, at least until we figured out a way to fight back. Alex, with his uncanny understanding of codes and patterns, suggested that we could use the Watcher's own methods against them. He believed that their network was vast, but not invulnerable. There were secrets they kept hidden, weaknesses we could exploit. But it would require us to delve deeper into their web, a dangerous game of cat and mouse. In the following days, we turned the cabin into our base of operations. Using a combination of old books and a limited internet connection via a secured line, we started unraveling the threads of the Watcher's network. Alex proved to be an invaluable asset, deciphering codes and patterns that would have taken us days to crack. As we dug deeper, we uncovered the extent of the Watcher's influence. They had infiltrated various levels of government, corporations, and even international organizations. Their goal was control, control of information, control of resources, control of the very fabric of society. But their greatest secret, the one they guarded most fiercely, was their origin and their ultimate purpose. It was a mystery that seemed to stretch back centuries, a plan set in motion long before the modern world took shape. Our efforts did not go unnoticed. We encountered numerous attempts to track us down, both in the physical and digital world. The Watchers were relentless, but so were we. We became ghosts, always on the move, always one step ahead. Months turned into a year, and the cabin became more than just a hideout. It became a home. A home built on the foundation of a shared purpose, a bond forged in the fires of adversity. But we knew that this couldn't last forever. The final confrontation with the Watchers was inevitable. Then, one fateful night, it happened. They found us. We were awakened by the sound of vehicles approaching, the glare of headlights piercing through the darkness. They had come for us, an army against three lone rebels. We were ready. The cabin was rigged with traps and escape routes, a final stand in our war against the shadows. The battle was fierce and chaotic. Amidst the gunfire and explosions, we fought with everything we had. In the end, it was Alex who turned the tide. Using a device we had built, he sent a pulse that disabled the Watcher's electronic equipment, turning their technological advantage against them. It gave us the opening we needed to escape, to disappear into the night once more. But our victory was bittersweet. The Watchers were still out there, wounded but not defeated. We had won the battle, but the war was far from over. As we vanished into the woods, I looked back at the burning cabin, a symbol of our resistance. We were the unlikeliest of heroes, thrown together by fate, bound by a cause greater than ourselves. The road ahead was uncertain, filled with danger and darkness. But we had each other, and we had a purpose. We would continue to fight, to expose the Watchers, to protect the innocent for we were the only ones who could. In this twisted game of shadows and codes, we were the wild cards. And we would play our hand until the very end.